Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have John Droz here. Uh, John, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? All right. I'm a uh, scientist, specifically a physicist. I retired when I was 34, which is another long story. I was from upstate New York and uh, currently have a home. Uh, my primary home is in uh, coastal North Carolina. I have a summer home in the Adirondacks of upstate New York. I, since being retired, I've uh, decided to do a variety of things that have interest to me. And primarily, there's two, two objectives of what I do. One is I'm a defender of my profession, science. And the second is I'm uh, an advocate for citizens' rights. That's it. Let's talk about some of the work that you've done. Uh, I think you've done some pushing back against the wind power and solar power. Want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, ultimately, almost all the things I'm involved with, and I have a, an unusual uh, uh, breadth, more than probably anybody else you're going to deal with. I cover things from climate to COVID, from uh, renewables to religion, to education, to um, elections. Uh, most of the things, the commonality of them is that they relate to science. And uh, what, what, what I've seen here and doing these type of things for 40 years is that uh, science is being very systematically and aggressively attacked. Uh, the average person probably has no uh, appreciation of that, but uh, that, that is what's going on. And the reason is that science has been uh, what you might call a gatekeeper. So that, let's say if you're talking about energy there, uh, let's say wind energy specifically as an example, uh, when, when something like that is proposed, one of the first arguments they use to uh, justify getting it onto the grid would be that it is scientifically sound, things of that nature. So science would come into the picture by these advocates. So here's the problem. The problem is that on the one hand, every survey that's ever been done says that the vast majority of Americans are very supportive of science and they think that's a good thing. So if some, something is scientifically um, approved, if you will, it's sort of like giving it a good housekeeping seal of approval type of thing. So that's, that's, that's why these, these lobbyists and so forth do that, because they know that this is an endorsement. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is, despite all the uh, Americans thinking highly of science, there's another fact, and that is that 95 plus percent of Americans have no idea what science actually is. So on the one hand, they're supportive of it, but on the other hand, they don't really understand it. So that's, that's, that's the opening that these people use to make all sorts of claims, whether it's Dr. Fauci making them or a wind energy developer making them or a climate alarmist making them. They try to say, look, science, uh, we, we have science's blessing here, blah, 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 blah. But they know they're dealing with an audience that doesn't understand what that means. So they're not going to be challenged by it. So it leaves it to a few people who do understand it, like myself, uh, an actual scientist, who stand up and say, hey, what you're saying is not true, which is baloney. So that, that's, that's the simplest version of it. So the problem then becomes, uh, they're, of course, going to argue against you, me, these, these, these small number of people. So that's why the uh, scientists who know very well, for instance, that the climate change alarmism is baloney, have spoken up, and immediately these people are categorized in a negative way, like being deniers or something else here. So the whole idea is to disparage these people, to uh, undermine their credibility, blah, 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 blah. So instead of having a, a uh, a discussion about the science and say, okay, fine, you think no, uh, we think yes, let's hash this out. No, they don't do that. They, because they know if it was hashed out, they would lose. So they go about saying, okay, this, this person's not a climatologist, for instance, you know, an extremely narrow little tiny field or, or some other type of thing, They're, or deniers, they said, stuff like that. So 
that's what I've been dealing with for several decades on the, in the energy field. That uh, I, I don't have any agenda here, for instance, ab about energy or climate or anything else, other than is this science based as, as they're claiming? So let's step, take one more step back here to make sure we're on the same page here, or so you understand where I'm coming from. The question is, what is science? Now, that's an interesting topic. If you polled, let's say, people on the street and you asked 100 people, give me a definition of what science is, I can assure you that probably 95% of them wouldn't give you a, a very accurate answer. Well, what is it? Well, in my view, uh, the best answer I am aware of is that science, by definition, science is a process. That's it right there, that one little sentence. Science is a process. So when somebody asks you, what is science? The best answer is, science is a process. Well, then you say, okay, fine. Uh, what, what type of processes uh, are you talking about? Well, a good example of a process would be the scientific method. So that's a step-by-step -step, uh, methodology process uh, about... Uh, analyzing something that would be called a hypothesis at the beginning, you know, something that's speculated, possible, a guess, to see whether it actually checks out. So there's steps to go through to do that. Well, things have gotten so bad here now that they are now attacking the scientific method. I can get into that, but uh, it's, <laughs> scientific method has been with us for, and its derivations for 4,000 years. But over the last 10 years, these progressive liberalists are now attacking that. As I said, the science is being attacked on multiple fronts. And again, the reason they're attacking it is because scientific method uh, uh, exposes a lot of the things they're advocating as being bogus. So they, they've got to attack the, the process saying, well, that's, that's baloney. Uh, so never mind what that says. But the reason is, it, it, it reveals the things they're advocating, whether it's energy products or climate things or COVID things or whatever, it's revealing that it's bogus. So that's, that's really what I spent most of my time in, trying to educate the public about these type of things. Uh, part of the challenge is they say that most people are not, uh, are not what I would say, technically astute. They're technically challenged, let's say. Uh, so sometimes these arguments go over their head. So I try to simplify things, but uh, bottom line is, unfortunately, most of what uh, we hear in the media on these matters is, is not true. Not necessarily 100% false, but it's certainly not true across the board here. So once we understand what science is, uh, science, uh, science is a process. The second step question that's important to understand is, why do we have such a field of science? What's the point of it? Well, in my view, the, the answer to that is also quite important, and that is sci science exists to help give us answers to our technical problems. That's it. It's not, uh, not intended to be everything, but it's, it's an uh, extremely powerful, maybe the most powerful tool we have as far as getting answers to our technical problems. So for instance, if we're, if we're faced with a, a virus, the question is, well, what's the best uh, uh, policy to have to deal with that? Well, that, that's an example of a technical problem that uh, needs to have science come up with an answer. Same thing with energy. You say, okay, we believe that there are uh, uh, some of our conventional electrical energy sources aren't adequate. So what should we do as alternatives? Well, that's a, that's a technical problem. So again, science is supposed to be there. They're supposed to utilize science, uh, but unfortunately they don't. So that's where we get into the difficulty. If they did do, use science for these answers, there'd be no problem, but they rarely do. Maybe only by accident. So what do they use? They're, they're telling people they use science, but it's not science. So what, what is it? Well, the best way I'm explaining it to people is that there's a difference between what I'm, what I'm describing is uh, real science, genuine science. What they're advocating is political science. 
Now, the fact that they've even made up that they've they've made up that term, and they're really good at making up uh, terminology here to sell their ideas here. There's there's no reason there should be the word science in the political science of thing. It's politics. It's really what it is. So it's not it's not there's nothing science about it. It's politics, but they've coined it as political science to try to make it sound more credible. Because I said people by and large support science. So they can tag their name on and say, well, this is a this is a variation of science. Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's, a, it's public relations, it's marketing, it's things of that nature. It has nothing to do per se with science. So the simplest way I could phrase this to you, Tom, and you know, your listeners is that the, the ultimate fight we're having on our society here is between real science and political science. That's the fight. All of these issues come down to those things here. Real science, political science. Whether it's on energy sources, on climate, on COVID, on education, whatever. Real science versus political science. That's really what it amounts to. Now, most people don't understand that. So that's what I'm trying to do is to educate people about such things. But uh, that's the gist of it if you want to boil it down into a sound bite. We have a big, 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 big fight between political science and real science. Does that make sense to you? It totally does. Totally does. So uh, where are you waging this fight? I mean, are you in, uh, you're getting up in front of public meetings and talking at length about uh, these topics? Well, as I said, I, I was retired at 34. I'm now 76. So I've been <clears throat> evolving into this over that four years. The first 10 years or so, I spent time on, on environmental matters in New York State, for instance, fighting, um, well, an example of my major fight I was involved with was that uh, in upstate New York, uh, they actually have a large amount of water resources. Well, they don't even appreciate it there because it's they have so much. So for instance, in the Adirondack Park where I lived, um, there's over 3,000 lakes. Well, these are natural lakes. They're not dammed up rivers. There's over 3,000 lakes. So there's water every place. So a lot of other parts of the country, water is a scarce resource. So bottling companies like Nestle and others like that have come to upstate New York to extract their water, turn it off, bottle it, sell it to people in Arizona or California or New York City or whatever. Well, the problem is I saw it and some other environmental people I was working with is that there were no rules in New York State for how to regulate this commercial water extraction. They could just put a well in some place, tap into some aquifer and start carting off water carte blanche here. Uh, but that's a long story. But anyways, uh, I was successful with the help of some other environmental organizations getting New York State to pass some commercial water extraction rules uh, for the first time ever, maybe one of the first states in forever doing this. So it evolved in there. I got to know a lot of people and uh, somebody, I don't even remember who it was, said, John, you know, you're you're pretty good at the science-related matters. Uh, have you ever looked into industrial wind energy? The answer was no. Uh, I just assumed like most people that it was uh, a benign thing, no big deal. <laughs> probably good for the planet, blah, 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 blah. And this person said, I don't know, you, you ought to look into it. <laughs> Might not be what, uh, what, what, what you're being told. So I did look into it. And the more I investigated it, it was quite clear that it was absolutely not a good thing. Um, so that sort of started me off in that particular direction. So since I have the time to do whatever I feel like doing, uh, I just sort of go with the flow here. But for instance, uh, two years ago, I was asked to put together a team of experts to analyze the 2020 election result. Well, I wasn't an expert, uh, election expert, but I certainly know how to analyze data uh, because that's a science thing here, statistics, things of that nature. So as I said, I had no plan for that. The call I got was from a high level person. I, I don't wanna say who, but a very high level person. and. Uh, so I, I did ask some other uh, people I'd gotten to know. There were statistical PhDs if they wanted to participate in this. So I got five of them together. They all said yes. And we started um, uh, doing analysis. So the first first report, uh, first data we were given was Pennsylvania. This is 2020 now. 
And uh, so we generated a 40 some page report that is now evolved into 50 pages. Uh, but it was the first report in the entire United States, I'm aware of anyways, that was done on the 2020 elections. So subsequently, we've now done 10 major election reports and uh, that's all on our webpage. So I have a webpage, some of these different topics. So I have one webpage and that's your listeners here want to know here. It's uh, election-integrity.info. So that lists all of our reports, our 10 reports. Uh, they cover a variety of things, uh, all related to elections. So what does elections have to do with science? It has a lot to do with it because uh, who gets elected will determine our policies <laughs> and our policies are tend to be involving science. So we need to have people who are open-minded about what science really is and stuff like that. Second webpage I have since I'm talking about some of these other things is on COVID. So that's C19 science, no spaces, C19 science.info. And a third one, that's my oldest one is about energy and climate. And that's uh, wiseenergy.org. Well, those are the three main websites I have. I also have a Substack uh, that I've been doing now for several months. Uh, the topic of that is something no one else seems to have done, and that is uh, critical thinking. To me, that's that's something that uh, is an important, very important thing. And we need to do more critical thinking about the things we're told, what appears in the media and whatever. So. Once a week, I've been submitting a, an article on my Substack here. By critical thinking about societal matters is the full name of it. But if you just uh, Google my name there or put in a Substack, my name, you'll see them. They've become pretty popular. I put in one yesterday, uh, critical thinking about the 2022 election results, for example. So there are some things we ought to be thinking about there as an example. So that's another thing. So anyways, I, I, how I get these ideas across is through some of those mediums. Uh, another very important thing is that back in 2009, I started a newsletter. And the whole idea of the newsletter was to augment uh, what people see in mainstream media because they don't see the truth or they only see part of the story. They don't see anything on certain topics. I mean, how many things do you read in the newspaper about I don't know, nuclear energy development, for instance, SMR, well, almost never. So there's a lot of things like this that are going on that are quite important to us. I started that in uh, 2009, and at that time, it was a once a month uh, newsletter. I sort of decided on the, the time period based on whenever I would, uh, I'd set aside articles as I saw them or people would send them to me. And when I got to about a hundred articles, I said, well, it's time to do a time to publish it. So it worked out to about once a month. Then for whatever reason, more and more articles started appearing. And uh, so I got down to once every three weeks, more and more. So we're now down to once every two weeks. I hope it's not once every week, uh, that's too much. It's a lot of time for me to do these things here, but we're, we're doing once every two weeks. And uh, there's over 10,000 subscribers to this. I don't advertise or anything other than telling people like you. And so if anybody would like to get this, it's free. We cover all these topics I just said or mentioned earlier, climate to COVID, um, renewables to religion, uh, politics, uh, left and right, uh, uh, energy, I'm sorry, uh, elections to um, education. There are some an interesting potpourri of topics, but there's some there's an underlying theme there about science. Here. But it's free. And if they just send me an email, I, I assume you're going to post that on your site here, but it's AAPR John, that's Apple Apple Peter Robert, J O H N at northnet.org. Send that email to me and I'm glad to include them in our list of uh, critical thinking subscribers. So in addition to that, I do give uh, talks. I've probably given over 100 talks, ranging from uh, the U.S. Congress to the state legislators in North Carolina to just communities. I do write articles outside of the Substack. I know they've been published, a couple hundred of them, large number. And I do such strange things as occasionally being on podcasts. What can I say? So a, a potpourri of... Uh, 
methodology. Yesterday I was interviewed uh, by uh, a journalist in, uh, in Europe. So it's not just US here, we had a Sweden, so there was a, a video interview here from Sweden. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that those are my little efforts. I'm doing this by myself. I'm not, I, all these things I've done for free, by the way. So for instance, when I go to speak someplace, uh, they may want to reimburse me for travel, but I don't charge for, for giving talks. Um, most of the time I don't even charge for travel, but uh, it depends on where it is, of course. But uh, by and large, all of these things I'm doing, the website, help, and all that kind of stuff is free uh, because uh, I'm trying to encourage people to get educated about what science actually is and, and their, how to defend their rights. That's a long answer to your question. Is that, that understandable, Tom? Yeah, yeah, that, that's very good. And I did want to throw in here that uh, you emailed me about 10 different links, uh, different reports you've done. And I've already, uh, those are going to all be in the uh, show description. So people can click on those and, and read up on a lot of the work that you've done. So those are quite different than, than okay. what you see otherwise. I mean, quite different. For instance, one of them is about CO2, okay, carbon dioxide, which is being vilified by alarmists saying that climate uh, is being you know, destroyed by CO2 here. So I tried to make it into an interesting uh, methodology. So I made it into a court case. So the court case is where the alarmists who are claiming that the end of the world is gonna happen in 10 years or nine years now, down to now, uh, are accusing CO2 is the defendant. So the, the, the prosecutor here are these people who are accusing CO2 of uh, about a dozen different things, okay? So they have different, about 12 different uh, accusations, claims against CO2, why it's a bad thing. And so the defending lawyer here then gets up and gives an answer to each one of the, uh, the 12 uh, or so um, accusations that is made against this client, CO2. So I thought that might be a little more interesting that uh, would, would be ordinarily, but in every case here, the uh, the uh, the defending lawyer cites studies to support his 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 defense of his client. So no place does he just say take my word for it. He says here's why that's wrong, what the prosecutor is saying wrong, and here's ten studies that uh, support it. So that's one of the articles I gave you as a link. Right? Sort of different. All right, and you are with the CO two coalition, right? Yes, I have been for a while now, yes. Basically, it's a sort of a, a narrowly focused group here. It's a group of scientists and maybe some other experts. Right now, there's the membership. This is by invitation only membership here. So the membership is like 125 scientists, something like that. And uh, their focus is, as the name says, they're trying to defend CO2 from a lot of the malarkey that's being said about it. So that's that's the gist of it. We're, we're focused on defending CO2. Now they've divided the group up into different subparts. So for instance, uh, I'm, I am I volunteered to be on a, a, a subgroup that was called, uh, it was involved with education. So they decided to say, we're going to uh, try to counter the miseducation that's going on in our schools, K through 12. But they said, starting, we're going to go, let's say, K through six, you know, um, uh, school. And uh, what they decided to do was how we would do this is that we would put together two things, a series of videos aimed for children and a series of comic books aimed for children. So we've already produced uh, three of the comic books. So we have a, a person who's a phenomenal, um, uh, what are, artist, mm -hmm. let's put that okay. way, okay. who's drawn these things. So these are all hand-drawn comics there, every, 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 every block of every page. So they're like 20 pages long or something like that. And so then some of our, one or more of our members writes a story and uh, then the team gets together and critiques the story and the, 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 the graphics and 
it's a big process actually. And then you have to publish it and all that kind of other stuff. But we now publish three. Uh, this has all been sort of uh, below the horizon, but there's going to be some uh, more announcement about this shortly. The uh, group, the CO2 Coalition, is setting up part of their website to be focused on children's education. So these things will be listed there, uh, but they will be available from uh, Amazon and other places like that. So I have the copies of it, uh, um, but that, that's an example of something they're doing. They're trying to be creative to uh, counter some of the misinformation. Because if you look at textbooks otherwise in school, they're all alarmists here. So there's no there's no balance in these textbooks. So a third grader is reading nothing but fossil fuels are bad and right. CO2 is bad and blah, 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 blah. So our hope is you got to start someplace is to at least offer some of these type of things, whether it's to... Uh, homeschooling parents or private schooling or hopefully at some point to a public school. So that's an example. Do you do a lot of, uh, you do debates in public against people on the other side? Have you, or people don't do that against you? <laughs> uh, or ordinarily they're, they're astute enough not to do that. I've done some in writing. For instance, I got into a debate with a climatologist in upstate New York, who was just saying things that were baloney. And so I published my a response, a point by point rebuttal, blah, blah, blah. So I went back and forth a little bit, but uh, he gave up. I mean, there, there's no, they're, they're counting on dealing with people that don't really understand the situation. So well, once you're dealing with somebody that actually is a scientist and knows how science works and understands the difference between hypothesis and theory and stuff like that, well, they, 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 it, it's unlikely that they're gonna win that argument. Okay, very good. Um, do you write letters to the editor? <clears throat> On occasion, I've done that, yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to figure out uh, what advice you have maybe for the rest of us on uh, what stuff you've done that uh, to push back that has worked the best and uh, how we can follow your lead maybe to do some of the same things? Well, I'd say the first thing uh, is uh, you, you, can't, you can't fight back in person or in writing or anything else unless you know what you're talking about. Okay, So the first step, if you really want to do this, the first step is to get educated. Now, to me, the, 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 the simplest way to get educated for free is to subscribe to my newsletter. Because every issue, every two weeks, there's current reports, articles, mm -hmm. whatever, discussing, as I said, a, a wide variety of topics that 99% of people just aren't going to be aware of because they're not going to be in mainstream media. So if you start reading some of those top, those things, let's say you pick, pick a particular topic you're interested in, like COVID, let's say. Or, you know, I've dealt with a lot of people that are parents that are fighting, let's say, COVID mask mandates, as an example. So, okay, well, we actually have a section on COVID masks. And uh, we point you to reports, like you would go on my website as well. We have a couple of articles and studies about COVID masks. So once, once you pick a topic, a specific topic you're interested in, uh, you can drill down to that and get a lot more information very quickly. If you would like to be educated on a variety of current hot topics, COVID, climate, energy, stuff like that, well, then the newsletter is the thing to do because that covers all those and you can just skim through and read the articles that uh, tickle your fancy. That would be the best way. So once you get educated, well, then it's up to you to speak up. I mean, that's the other thing. A lot of times people don't speak up. But I think uh, probably the main reason is, is that they don't feel comfortable about <laughs> arguing with somebody else about it. They don't feel qualified, let's say. Well, that's that's the point. If they have, if they've been reading the newsletters, they will be more qualified than almost anyone they're going to be dealing with. If it's a scientist, it's a PhD or something, fine. You just send them to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll deal with them if it needs to be. So, but by and large, your neighbors and relatives and stuff like that uh, would be easy pickings after you've read the newsletters here a few times and start paying attention. So by the way, in every newsletter we give out, we give the archive out. So you can go backwards 
and see the newsletters that were published last month or in August or July. Just skim through it. You can do a search over the whole thing. For instance, as I said, if, let's say if you're interested in masks, you just take the word mask and search over it and you'll find probably 50 things that have to do with masks just in 2022. <clears throat> then we have a 2021 um, archive as well. You do the same thing there. But it, it's pretty easy to, uh, once you've picked out a topic, to uh, find a lot of uh, very powerful, useful information. So after that, uh, once you get somewhat educated, yes, then you should be doing things like if you see something in the, the paper, your local paper, that's that's baloney, you should, in a polite way, uh, speak up and say, you know, that you're, you're making claims here that just uh, aren't based on real science. This is political science, blah, 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 blah. And you can always end up with it, depending on what the claim is, to say, for more information, go to one of my websites, let's say. So if it's a, a climate issue, or let's say it's a, C, a COVID issue, say c19science.info, so you can end it with that. Go to c19science.info for more details. And that, that'll... If, if people really are interested in that, then fine. That's what they'll do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yep. I was curious if people are fighting back against like wind farms or solar farms, like two or three states away, the do they uh, appeal to you for your help and wh what to do to fight back? Or Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I got a call from somebody uh, I don't know, yesterday from Nebraska and the day before from Kansas. I mean, the fact is that uh, it has nothing to do with where we're located. The fight is the same in any of these states. Um, that, that's, that's what's on my wiseenergy.org website. I have two, two particular pages to help people in that regard. And by the way, two things. One is that's one of the things that's different from myself and most scientists, like 99% of scientists, is that I have worked extensively on what I would call a grassroots level. Others, I'm dealing directly with the public. 99% of scientists don't do that. I mean, they might write an article or report, but as far as someone's calling them up and say, yeah, I have such and such an issue in my community, how do I go about dealing with it? They say, well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm in academia here, or I work for some other organization or whatever, and that, that's not my bailiwick. I, I don't know the ins and outs of that. And the other hand, that's exactly one of the things I do. So on my web, wiseenergy.org webpage, I have uh, two pages connected together, yeah, winning and documents, key documents. And uh, they, they specifically explain how to win these type of fights uh, in, in a local community manner. Second point I want to make is that uh, you just said something that uh, is going to be a trigger. So just like uh, this is part of being educated here that uh, you need to pass this on. But uh, words are really important. I mean, really important. And one of the major differences between the left and the right is that the left has done a much, much, much better job in marketing, PR, communication, things of that nature. And part of that is that they have gone out of their way to focus on creating uh, terminology that is effectively supporting their ideology. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, they make up stuff. So one, I'm, the example you just used here was wind farm. That's a ultimate no-no. <laughs> There's no such thing as a wind farm. The only thing that's farm is subsidies. But why did they come up with that? Well, they made that phrase up very specifically. Uh, they knew they were going to put, inject an industrial complex in the middle of a rural area. And they knew very well from the get-go that this would not go over well with rural people, have this industrial thing in there. So they said, we need to market this so that it seems like uh, something that it isn't. So that's how they come up with the phrase, wind farm. And the idea is, is that that terminology sort of gives the impression that this industrial complex is uh, benign or, uh, I, I don't know, beneficial, whatever. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a lie. And so my advice to people is be careful of the terminology you use because every time somebody says wind farm, uh, they are effectively endorsing 
the left's uh, ideology here by giving some credence to that. So I have completely scrubbed that from my vocabulary. I say wind project or industrial wind project or wind facility, some other phrase like that. At no time will I be using wind blank. So we need to be careful about it. There's a lot of other stuff they say that's made up, like clean energy is another thing here. There's no such thing as clean energy. That's a lie. It's every part of it. Let's say if you take wind energy, turbines as an example, there's a huge amount of things that are dirty by their definition. But they know that clean energy is sellable. Who's going to say, hey, are you against clean energy? Well, who's going to say, well, no, I, I hate clean energy. Well, <laughs> but the fact is what they're actually pushing is not clean energy, despite the, the name of it. So that's, that's an area that uh, we need to pay more attention to, uh, terminology and, and language. So words are important. Okay. So instead of solar farm, is it better, uh, like, do you say we don't solar use that term farm? Yeah. Yes. Solar facility? Is yes. That... Okay. Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Solar project. Right. Okay. Same idea. Yes. Good. Be imaginative, Tom. You can do that, I'm sure. Sounds good. Yeah. No, that's good. Great advice. You must face a lot of uh, personal uh, pushback or ad hom attacks on yourself. And uh, do you have any advice on handling those or you just, just ignore them? Or? Well, this week, I think it was early this week, um, I was sent a, uh, uh, a Twitter thing about me that was pretty lengthy. It was, the th it was more than just a little Twitter comment. It was a, supposedly a, a research piece about me. Uh, that, I saw uh, it, yeah. Okay, you did see it. Okay. I did see it, yeah. The, the, the problem is that uh, the first thing is this person who did this research never of course bothered to ask me to verify anything so that that tells you all you need to know right there i mean if this if this was a genuine uh investigation let's say as a minimum any competent journalist or such person would say i want to have a double check of my uh claims here they'd send it to me and say okay here's what we're planning on saying you tell us if there's anything wrong here well they don't have to accept my telling them but as a minimum, they would have at least asked. But the, for instance, in this particular piece, piece it said, I, uh, I was a real estate developer. Well, this, this has been a, something that's put, put out by some trolls uh, years ago. And that's what happens. When these people do research, what they're just doing is Googling something on the internet and, and they find somebody else who made up something. So if I said, Where'd you get that garbage? And they say, well, here it is right here on the internet. Well, it's from another idiot and say, where did he get it? Well, I got it from somebody else. And the whole thing is just a, a house of cards here. I've never, never been a real estate developer or anything like that in my life. And yet this pops up every so often, but it's just a continuity of uh, incompetence <laughs> that's really saying these type of things. So um, I... By and large, I just ignore it. Sometimes uh, my, my feeling, it depends, but sometimes my feeling is, number one, what's the point of engaging this? This person is not a credible person. They're not an honest person. They, they don't really have any uh, objectivity here or <laughs> sincere interest. The, their one object is, is to try to make me look bad. I mean, that's their whole point. So what's the point of having a conversation with somebody that their whole objective is to try to make you look bad. How, how is that going to go? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty much a waste of time. Second of all, sometimes when you, when you get back and forth on these things here, it just gives the thing more credibility. A perfect example of that was uh, one of our election integrity reports. Uh, some, some of these were, we, we did on request, some we made up by our team's uh, decision to make it up. So one of them was that we had seen so many articles about how Trump was losing every lawsuit related to the 2020 election that I said um, to my team, I said, look, based on how inaccurate the uh, media is about almost everything else, it's highly likely they're inaccurate about this too. So I said, why don't, why don't we do a report on that? So I did do a report, me and one of the team members, so it was the two of us. 
And what we did was we identified every single court case that was uh, Trump had some involvement in or was about the 2020 presidential election in the country. So we come up with, I think, 90, 94 cases. And by the way, when a case uh, was uh, turned down and then went to an appeal and so on and so forth, we didn't count those as separate cases. That was all one case. So we had 94 cases. And we we, we did some things of uh, comparative about them. And in every case, by the way, we had a link. So if you want to see the actual case, you just click on the link and you go to it. So we're not asking anybody to uh, uh, take our word for any of this here. So we had several columns here. Are you familiar with that here? Or is that the type of thing you want to show on a screen here? Sure, sure. Yeah. If it... Well, let me let me bring it up here. What I meant to say. Election-integrity.info. So on the screen here, uh, this is our election integrity reports here. So the first 10 are are what my team and I did here. And they were in various aspects of the 2020 election uh, matter. So I'm talking about here now number six. Okay, so I'm going to open this up here. All right. So I wasn't aware of anybody that did this, certainly to this detail. So what we have here is a, effectively a spreadsheet. But on the left-hand column are all of the, uh, the, the cases that we found. Okay, so if you look down here, this is... There's a lot of work that went into putting this together here. A lot of work. There's there's no other source to my knowledge that's as detailed as this is. <laughs> so here's the other columns we decided to add on here. One was what the date was when the first initial legal action was filed. And then we decided to say what was the what was the general topic that was at stake here being discussed. So there's like four major topics. Um, see a lot of them are process or rules, things of that nature. Um, these came down here, but then here's one that has to do with voters, but a lot of them had to do with rules. So some of, some of these things, these newspaper articles say, well, all these things are about fraud. Well, no, that isn't true. This is a matter, a lot of these, as you can see, were really a, a lawsuit about was the state attorney general or the state department of state person or the governor following the rules of their own state? And lots of times they weren't. So for instance, they were making decisions that were supposed to be made by the legislature, as an example. And they just had an excuse saying, well, it's COVID. We don't have the time for this legislative nonsense, so we're just going to skip that. Well, that's essentially what we come down to, quite frankly. It seems absurd, but that's the type of thing. So those are, those are examples of rules here that were uh, violated, okay? Anyway, so the next column over was probably the most important one in some regards, and that is, was the case actually decided based on merits? In other words, did a judge hear evidence, consider the evidence, then write a, a decision adjudicating the matter based on the evidence. Well, so you can see here, most cases, the answer is no, they didn't. So there were excuses they made like, well, you filed this too late, or you don't have standing to file this claim here, or other type of things like that. Okay, we're going to get back to that in a minute. Uh, so the next column is what state was involved. The next column we made up was about what, uh, what sort of a, a one sentence summary of what was, what was being adjudicated. You know, that's a matter of opinion as to whether that's right or not. But I mean, <laughs> that's why we gave you the link. If you want to see the whole thing, go read the thing. But this is my opinion, our, my, me and my associate here, a one sentence summary. And the next column was sort of interesting disposition. So we color coded here what happened in all these cases here. So red was where they lost, Trump was Republicans lost, green was where they won, gray there were where things were adjudicated without considering the merits. So there was no winner or loser. They didn't talk about the issue. They, mm -hmm. they didn't even hear it. Blue means that they were combined with some other case later and you had to follow that up. 
So if you look down here, so we tried to do this to see what, so you can see which were winners and losers here, which is sort of interesting. And I didn't know anybody else that had done this. So anyways, you're gonna come down to the bottom here uh, and you'll see, okay, I said 94. So I, I, I my senior moment, 92 cases there. You see that line there, it says grand totals. 92. So the key point that we were trying to make here was how many of those 92 were decided on the merits? A couple haven't been resolved even as of yet, but 30 here were decided on the merits. So the question is, okay, where the judge actually heard evidence and made a ruling based on the evidence <laughs> in 30 cases, how many of those did Trump and the GOP win? And the answer was 22 out of 30. Now, where have you seen that in the media saying Trump has won the majority of uh, merit adjudicated cases? Never. No. Never. Well, okay, that's the point of my newsletter. It's kind of stuff to tell you some facts that are, this is, as I say, this is, these are facts. Now, as soon as we published this on our website, a couple of uh, media outlets, by and large friendly, uh, published it. And, 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 you know, wrote an article about it saying, this is a great thing. I heard probably from a hundred lawyers saying, I'm going to use this as a reference. This is the best over analysis that anyone's done on this, blah, 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 blah. I said to people, if there's any mistakes you made, let me know. Uh, we had a couple of typos and stuff like that, as you can see with all this stuff that would be likely to happen, but not, nothing was uh, significant. Anyways, after this, uh, some of these articles, it was published in, I don't know, a dozen or so media outlets. After that, all of a sudden, uh, we heard from the Associated Press saying, we're doing a fact check on this crap here. <laughs> so I got an email from uh, an associate, Associated Press, uh, I don't know, technically it's supposed to be a journalist, but let's say employee, I don't want to call this person a journalist. And they, they, she called me, I guess what happened. She said, uh, can you answer some questions about this? And I said, well, maybe she emailed me first, I forget. So the, the, the email said, can you answer some questions about this, this document here? And I said, well, um, I'm glad to answer any questions. Uh, what, what is your time frame here? You know, I'm a busy person. I got a lot of things going on here. So I said, what's your time frame? Well, this was like three o'clock in the afternoon. And she said, well, it's going to go to press at six o'clock. So you got maybe two hours. Oh, my goodness. So I said, OK, fine. So I'll drop everything here. This is the Associated Press after all. So this says this is international coverage. So I stopped everything else. So they had like eight questions that they asked. So I wrote out an answer for every one of those eight questions and had it back to her in about an hour. So like four o'clock. Well, sure enough, uh, I didn't hear back, but sure enough, the next day it was published as, as she had said. So I went and read this, this piece here and uh, effectively the first point, first takeaway was is that she didn't use any of the information I provided her in giving her answers to the eight questions. Not a bit of it. It was like I didn't even put them down. I mean, what's the point? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were, maybe they're just trying to catch me up here or something, but there, there's no point to it. She never, never utilized any of the answers as far as I can see. Second of all, she made uh, a variety of, just like these other trolls, uh, disparaging comments to try to undermine cr my credibility. She, she, she made sentences like, John claims to be a physicist. <laughs> what the hell? You know, and that, that, that wasn't one of her questions, by the way. I mean, if she had asked me, can you send me a, a, a copy of your physics degrees? I, I'd be glad to do that. I had that. <laughs> she never brought that up about uh, my, my, my degrees. Uh, I have one from uh, physics in, in Boston College and then the graduate degree from Syracuse University. She never brought that up in the question. So. But then she, she had the audacity to make aspirations here like this was just, you know, part of a scam here that I, <laughs> I, was, I was a make-believe person. Um, second thing was, is that even though they had a fairly long hour, if you can Google it, see for yourself, but she, uh, at no point did she actually say anything on this document was wrong. 
She didn't point out a single thing saying, that's an error, you know? Not one thing. What she said was, is that they had consulted with some college professor, some, some left-wing person who she said, would you look at this probably for me and probably spent all of five minutes <laughs> on it. And, and his, his sum and substance answer was, well, some of the things on there are speculative. But he didn't give any other examples. He said some of the things. Well, you know, as I said, the, my, my, our column of issues, that was a matter of some opinion, yes. But uh, the, the name of the case and the length of the case, no. The date of the case, no. The topic, well, you could say some of those are a matter of opinion. Slide it on the merit, so on and so forth. By and large, uh, there was very little, if any, speculation. But he found any major significant speculation. He didn't cite a simple example, a, a single example, not one. So they had this whole long article, the Associated Press, uh, basically poo-pooing this, this important document, but without any evidence of <laughs> where it was wrong. None, no specific things. So, anyway, uh, that, that, that you you asked, do I get a you, you you shouldn't open up these can of worms. You asked me if I get I get periodically attacked. I'm giving you an example of what happened there. Very good, very good. So here's the other things we have here. Probably, probably the most important one we did here was number ten. Uh, this is and that's the thing we need now. Why most people think that audits are being done. Uh, the fact is, there is no meaningful audit done in any state, in any county, or any precinct in the entire United States. Zero. Zero. Really? Okay. Well, all they're doing, what they're calling an audit, is really double-checking the math. Now, so if you look at this report, number 10 here, see that link there, right? We, we were the first people to write up a report about what a, what a post-election audit ought to be, should be. Okay, so this is back, this is done 6-8-21. So I wrote uh, the introduction and, uh, you know, so forth. Then we had different people that uh, on my team here that wrote, participated here. <clears throat> but the gist of what we tried to show was that uh, you ought to, to get an idea what an audit is, you got to compare what happens with the IRS. So the IRS actually has several levels of audits. So the simplest audit that they have on the IRS is where they check the math. So for instance, you send in your 1040, they check to see everything adds up. So if you have an arithmetic error, well, they will probably fix it for you. They will know where it was probably, or they would send it back to you and say, this doesn't add up. Most of the time, they'll just fix it to you and send it back. Well, that, that's essentially what the current audits are. Somebody's checking the math. Well, that, that is pathetically lightweight, just the same as that would be in IRS. So the next level of audit is, is that they then, they then go and compare uh, what's been submitted by other people to you. So for instance, if your bank sent a statement said they gave you $1,000 of interest and that didn't show up on your claim here under interest, they would send you a note saying, how come that uh, how come that doesn't match our files here? Okay, so that's a little, that's a step up from just checking the math. Well, there's no such thing as that really in the, in the current uh, election process system, even then. The next step up would be where they actually investigate certain uh, claims you made. So let's say let's say you claimed a, a five thousand deduction for a charity. They may come back to you and say uh, we don't have records for your five thousand dollars of contributions for that charity, or they may dispute that that's a charity that's eligible for a tax credit, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. The top level audit is uh, an on-site audit where you, they come to your house and uh, or your place of business and they go through everything. Well, that, that would be the equivalent to a forensic audit on the election business. And we're not even remotely close to that, but that's really what should be done, at least on a sample basis. And now, since we're showing the screen here, why don't we show another screen? We'll show you what the, uh, okay, here, here's the uh, Substack, uh, my most recent Substack piece here. So you see the top there, it says, this is the, the overall title. 
critically thinking about select societal issues. So this just appeared yesterday. Okay. I have a variety of other things. Uh, if you just scan down here, this is another one about election integrity last week. This is another one about uh, US election integrity because these are all coming up. And here's one about, uh, oh, I'm calling it the big picture. Then we had one about uh, industrial solar, talking about that. And these are a few weeks ago. This is about uh, COVID lessons. Uh, we had one about wind energy. There's one about wind energy. So we're covering a variety of topics there, what I'm calling critical thinking. Critical thinking about these things. So we're going to a little more depth. A third site I have is this uh, C19 Science, which is the COVID site here. Uh, that that has some really fabulous uh, stuff on it that uh, nobody else has. Starts off here with uh, three major reports. These three reports, uh, th these are profound thing. The first one is it's attacking, uh, I'm attacking the uh, medical profession, the medical establishment, I'm calling it. So that would be the FDA, the CDC, AMA, all these type of people, how they have uh, gone away from science, mm -hmm. what their positions are, have essentially zero basis in science and so forth. So they said a lot of these things are about, about science here. So anyways, those are, those are some things here that people ought to be aware of and follow along if they want to get educated on these type of topics. Now, okay. Yeah, that is great stuff. Uh, how many hours a week do you work? Well, a lot. I am supposed to be retired here, but I like playing golf, stuff like that. Well, I haven't played golf in like four or five months. What can I say? Um, you, you have to do what you have to do. But uh, yes, it, this is a lot of work. How is the uh, fight against the industrial wind facilities and industrial solar facilities changed over the last 20 years? Is it pretty much the same or, or things are different now? Um, I, I think it's uh, from, a, from a citizen point of view, it's gotten better because uh, what, what, what we have now is a lot more studies uh, that can support uh, arguments that undermine the claims here by these developers. So people today, compared to people 10 years ago even, they have probably twice as many studies, let's say on uh, the harm of wind energy noise, turbine noise, uh, infrasound. Well, there's a lot more studies out than there were out 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So from those, that point of view, uh, citizens have uh, a much stronger case and they can make really good arguments. On the flip side, uh, a lot of states have been compromised by uh, lobbyists. So as every day goes by, these lobbyists are getting more and more ingratiated into the system. And it's hard to, to dislodge these people, obviously. So. What can I say? It's a complicated matter. Okay, very good. All right, I think this is a good wrap up point unless you have another, uh, anything else that you'd like to say here or any other points to make? You're gonna post my email, right? For these people? Yeah, if you're okay with that, I'll post it in the show description. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A -A apple, apple, Peter, Robert, John, J-O-H-N at Northnet, one word, N-O-R-T-H-N-E-T dot -E org. Okay. So if anyone wants to sign up for the newsletter, Ask me a question in general, whatever. They just send me an email. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. You're a very interesting guy. I really enjoyed hearing you speak. And I have a lot of reading to do now still to uh, catch up with some of what you're saying. But th thank you very much. I didn't send you those, those links, Tom, to uh, be a burden on your life here. I sent them because they're sort of unusual things that I thought if you're really mm -hmm. interested in these topics that you'd find uh, pretty worthwhile. No, oh, absolutely. I, and I have, uh, I've clicked on a bunch of them since I talked to you last, but I need to spend more time because it's uh, a lot of really good stuff out there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity here, Tom. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Thank you.